much. Thank you very much uh, for having a um, uh, talk, which for this audience might be an applied talk. So I'm a theoretical physicist, and beyond the structures which have been uh, discussed during the uh, uh, workshop so far, which are beautiful structures, I'm also interested in finally calculating numbers. So my starting point is that I'm... <laughs> so are we? <laughs> sure. It might be a different type or a different collection of numbers that right. you are interested in. <laughs> so uh, the starting point for this project is uh, something which is very close to the motivation Matija Tavoskovich gave this morning. Uh, at the end, we would like to calculate Feynman diagrams, that is, we want to evaluate a function of some parameters. Uh, these parameters, they can be uh, momenta of the particle involved in the scattering process, they can be masses of the particles involved, or they could also be something more sophisticated like spin. Let me, in general, just write P1 to Pn. And then, afterwards, uh, everybody knows there is the Feynman formalism which allows to calculate these objects based on a graphical expansion which tells you which integrals you want to evaluate. And then, of course, some uh, graphics which you can draw and in complicated formalism which uh, tells you which integrals you want to evaluate in order to get a number for this particular object once you plug in the uh, external parameters. Now, uh, this has been 60, 80 years of work uh, which went into calculating this type of objects and I'm not going to review any of it. But I'd like to ask the question, what is, given a certain Feynman diagram, a useful space of functions I can use in order to express the result for this Feynman diagram. And I would like to keep the parameters in a certain form open. This is, I would be very happy if for a very basic diagram I get the logarithm of, say, a ratio of those two parameters, and then I know that is precisely the function I'm looking at. And it turned out, and that has maybe a very successful, it has been a very successful story in physics, that polylogarithms defined as iterated integrals on Riemann surfaces turned out to be a very nice way of classifying actually the solution spaces for these Feynman integrals or Feynman amplitudes. And at the same time, these uh, polylogarithms on Riemann surfaces, there are also functions uh, which show up not only for scattering amplitudes in uh, quantum field theory, but also in string theory. And there it is much more, uh, much, much more obvious that we are landing on those functions. So I will uh, talk about iterated integrals on complex manifolds in general and more precisely I will talk about uh, iterated integrals on compact Riemann surfaces so I will specify to dimension one manifolds And the main idea in this, in this concept is that some of the information about the scattering process, that is some of those external parameters, will be used to determine the geometry of the Riemann surface in question, and that will allow uh, to perform uh, integrals or to perform these calculations with keeping the parameters 
open because we can just define polylogarithms which de depend on a period matrix or a modular parameter, which then can be connected to those parameters. So, if you have a compact Riemann surface, of course, we uh, can always have an isomorphism to an algebraic curve, and that's the language I will be using for the start and later switch to something else. So, uh, the main goal in the more mathematical setting is integrate rational functions on uh, a Riemann surface or on Riemann surfaces. And uh, everybody here knows that a lot of work, some of which also has been recorded on in this week, has been done on uh, Riemann surfaces of G0. That is where the polylogarithms uh, and I'll put quotation marks in here because now they include also uh, higher uh, polylogarithms uh, showed up. Uh, there was, of course, Fermat and Nielsen classical polylogarithms, which were there later. Uh, uh, Fermat and uh, several other people uh, looked at harmonic polylogarithms and uh, formalized the uh, object objects a little. And there can be these polylogarithms on the genus zero surface can be uh, phrased or formulated as integrated integrals over differentials on the Riemann surface, which are just dz over z minus a, where a is the ball which I can uh, put wherever I want. And a lot of uh, beautiful structures have been showing up, a half algebraic structure which allows to derive functional relations between these polylogarithms. That's something which is very well understood. In particular, one can also calculate multiple zeta values as special values of those polylogarithms. And here, uh, a lot of work also has been done. Some of them are, but some of the people are here in the audience uh, for evaluating them efficiently uh, based on analytic properties of these polylogarithms. Efficient calculation. And then, physicists recognized once you reach a certain level of complexity for those Feynman integrals, that is, you have too many scales, that is, a couple of masses, or too many legs, then you are not able to express the functional dependence on these external parameters in terms of these genus zero polylogarithms anymore. And off we go to genus one and we'll be talking about uh, elliptic polylogarithms. And for these elliptic polylogarithms, a lot of different languages are available, and the classification of those languages uh, is um, something which uh, mathematicians and later physicists all learned uh, during the last 20 years, maybe, or the application at least in physics was uh, in the last 20 years. And the central object here is a conical function which serves as a generating function <coughs> for differentials once I integrate those over. Uh, once I integrate them iteratively, uh, which will deliver, first of all, homotopy invariant integrals, and secondly, allows for a beautiful, uh, nice uh, algebraic structure underlying there. So, let me. Eisenstein? Is he Eisenstein? Or 
you you call it chronic function? No, we wait for the rest. Yeah, we're doing more chronic. Oh, okay. I don't know what function. Also, you know, there's uh, it's a chronic delta. Depending on the source you are referring to, it has different names, but each of them contains chronic. Uh, sometimes it's only called the chronic function. Let me let me just <coughs> take the minimal name. Okay, and this is is a function which can be uh, traced uh, in the following way. Um, let me just write a, uh, a presentation here. Um, over one and then we get a sum. Section, uh, I define the quantities V as the exponential of 2 pi i z, u as the exponential of uh, minus 2 pi i and uh, u uh, as the uh, exponential of the signal. Something wrong. Yeah, there, there is no opening parenthesis. There is after the sum. Oh, no, yeah, no. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> not compared <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so, once we have this uh, object, the uh, conical function and other representations are, of course, available here. Then we can do something which we have seen already in Oliver Schlotter's talk. You can cancel the pull, which happens once, uh, which happens for uh, alpha equals zero, and uh, expand that into uh, kernels. So uh, we can write that alpha times uh, z of alpha and r uh, is a sum. Then from zero infinity to g of n alpha to the power n. And it is those integrations, kernels, once supplemented with a dz, which I can iteratively integrate over and one can prove, show that this is actually a space closed under integration. And a valid representation of elliptic polylogarithms. There uh, is also something which is called elliptic multiple zeta values. These are actually not values, but they are functions of the modular parameter, and uh, quite a number of considerations have been done regarding these. Uh, quasi numbers, and you can derive beautiful relations uh, in the same way as you can derive relations between multiple zeta values. Okay, we can use the space here. Um, uh, when it converges, say again, please. When, when this series converges, it, it doesn't matter, you extend it analytically. That's no, no, it's uh, about numerical evolution. What? Um, this, uh, actually, a good part of the talk will be totally non-numerical because I'm uh, developing a language which will then, at the very end, allow me numerical evaluation. So this is just a formal expansion of the formal parameter alpha for the moment. And then once you actually take the iterated integrals, then you have to think about conversions. And, uh, well, you might mention that f is a quotient of theta series. And that the series, well, not that everybody in the audience knows them. So it's it's a quotient of two, one theta, two theta series. That's so this will theta for theta, the yeah. completely for the F series, of course, settle these convergence. But I can't do the same argument. 
from what I'm going to be telling yeah, about just, genus 2. for the question, yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, in general, there is uh, four languages which uh, all these uh, things uh, about the iterated integrals actually proceed in. One is, of course, the language of looking at the uh, elliptic curve with <coughs> cycles here. Yeah. And the other one would be a uniformization in terms of a, a, a fundamental domain where I would just put the modular parameter here. Uh, and of course, you can also represent it as a algebraic curve where the two cycles of the curve are just like so. Chosen, but what I will be mostly be concerned with is something called the uh, Schottky uniformization, uh, and this Schottky uniformization is something which most of you probably will have seen as just two concentric circles for a uh, genus one uh, setup. But in this talk, we will need the Schottky uniformization for. Uh, higher genera of Riemann surfaces, and so it will be based on pairs of circles which are mapped onto each other by the uh, by a, uh, map, and then uh, there is a curve connecting the two uh, the two circles in the middle. This is called a loxodromy. And the cycles, this is still the genus one picture, are such that the A cycles represent and are mapped onto the circles, and the B cycles are just the piece of the smoxodromy which is in between those two. So, let me define. Schottky language a little better. So, uh, the Schottky uniformization, and I'd like to apologize if that is too simple or too clear, but I need it as a starting point for, uh, for a higher genus. So, if I have the usual picture for the Schottky uniformization, then uh, the fundamental domain is actually uh, the shaded region between the two circles. One circle is a circle uh, around the point zero, the other one is a circle around in uh, infinity. And of course, there is an exponential map between uh, the uh, fundamental domain. And for simplicity, this is not a requirement, let us stick to purely imaginary parameter uh, tower for the moment, and then we have an exponential map between these two uh, quantities. You always have an exponential map. Say again, please. You always have an exponential map. That's for sure. If you, so if we see. That you, you assume this thing, you have an exponential map. No, I don't assume it. I can explicitly write down the easiest yeah. exponential. On the left hand side is just C star modular Q. Precisely. Yeah. If we um, uh, look up, actually, this is very nice to, lead, uh, to read Schottky's original papers, uh, then you can uh, extend uh, this uh, Schottky uniform section to uh, the following uh, statement. So let us uh, let C1 to CH, and H is the genus counting parameter, and C1 prime to ZH prime uh, be 2H usually disjoint. Drawing curves, so everything uh, smooth and non intersecting. Uh, and of course, these are curves on C1 
Sea bomb. Uh, and then we uh, can define operators gamma i. They are called sometimes logsodromic operators, which are have a representation in SL two because they map uh, curves to curves or in the classical case, cycles to cycles, and these logsodromic operators, they are such that gamma i of psi, ci is precisely ci prime. And this, and for this talk, we will just confine to this, defines the so-called Schottky group. What, what is gamma i? It is a map. Uh, a map of what? You just gave it an, it's a map of the complements? No, it is a map, uh, which uh, is a... Uh, so you go from where to where? It goes from uh, C bar to C bar. Morphic? Uh, I don't know what this means. It is a, a it is a homomorphic map. It's, a, it's also a continuous map. Well, if it's, if it's not homomorphic, then it's, it's just a Möbius transformation. Yes, precisely. It, oh, it okay. is a Möbius transformation. Okay, thank you. So it's a how many values are true? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, There's no way we can know. Just yeah. Uh, okay. Let lots of time operators. Good. And the Schottky group then itself is generated by the gamma i for i uh, elements of 1 to the genus. And for here, for this talk, we'll Use what is called the classical Schottky group. And the classical Schottky group uh, is, so the Schottky group is called classical if you uh, confine these uh, curves to be circles. So let's, let's make this very simple. And then let's, let's have a uh, picture here. Say we have a uh, compact complex. And what is the group? And of all these gammas? Yeah, but well, we don't know what the gammas are. They're just the setting. No, it, it could be a free group. It could be a discrete group. It could be dense. I mean, we have, if the C, you haven't. So you know, if, if each of the, the gamma i's is a Möbius transformation, then they uh, generate a group which could be free. It could be discrete. It could be dense. It could be lots of things. Uh, there must be some definition of a short key group. It's not just a free group, I assume. Okay. Free, free. I think it is a free group. It's a free discrete group. Uh, there is no uh, relations in between these uh, generators of the group. It's a free group. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So why is it called short key, not free? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, short key because short key was the one who actually used that description of our genus. Uh, so, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, make an example here. So, here that would be a genus 2 example. And I can have uh, some uh, two circles which are related uh, like that to each other. So, I would have two generators which generate the free group. And uh, this allows me to as well define it, to prove that, that a fundamental domain in the sense of, uh, in the sense of, you know, we call a fundamental domain here in the standard uniformization is the uh, space outside of all of the circuits, the exterior of and correspondingly, these Möbius transformations, they will actually map 
the complete outside of those transformations into each of those circles, so you'll actually see an image of the outside map. And that the pictures I'm going to show you at the very end, and you'll precisely see this property nicely. So, now let's talk about uh, genus 2 uh, connections. Uh, we want to have some analog of this Kronecker function here, which I wrote down for genus 1, which uh, will act as a generating function for differential which I want to iteratively integrate over. Uh, yes. Are you talking about the outside of the circles being mapped into the inside? The outside of all of the circles is a fundamental domain. Yeah. That is, if you specify a point in here, then this is a unique specification. And each of these operators maps the complete outside into these circles, and you can actually see them. To one circle? Uh, no, to all, all of them. them. So the complement is connected? Whereas yes, so precisely. So that, that's a... Uh, and this is a fundamental domain to the surface. This is not the yes. uniformization. It is, the it is, it is the uniformization, it's the fundamental domain for the surface. The outside of all of those surfaces. So your map is not continuous if it maps something connected to something that's connected. It's a strange map. Huh? No, the surface is the surface of G has G H. Yeah, it's connected. Yeah. You were saying this complement is maps to the inside of the circles. And each yes. element of the group. It's like the usual fundamental domain for SL2C. So one element of the group maps the whole complement into one circle. Yes, precisely. Uh, I, I hope yeah, I didn't say anything. anything no, that was else. his question. Yes. It's just like a random one. Okay, there have been uh, connection forms for uh, genus uh, for genus 2 uh, Riemann surfaces. Uh, one is the uh, connection which was published by Enriquez, I think the publication was 2014, and this is based on a generalization of the Kronecker function, which consists of objects in J, depending on now the two uh, variables, and this is defined as the sum over a multi-index. I want to, uh, first of all, I need to have a uh, to sum over the number of indices, S larger equal to zero, and then it's I1 to IS, uh, and these parameters go from uh, 1 to H, and then we can, or well, I is defined, some analog of these kernels G over there, which are labeled by precisely the indices you would expect, except that there is this index J for the Direction. These are again functions, um, two variables, and this uh, connection. And this is something we saw in Oliver Schott's talk. Comes with uh, some algebra generators which generate a free algebra. And uh, these, for now, let's say they are formal, uh, non commuting variables in the same sense, uh, yeah, they are common non-commuting variables. And then Enriquez defined the uh, two analog of the quantum function as the sum over j equals 1 to h, j can be between 1 to the genus, and uh, it's just defined it as the sum over the and x, and again here we have a formal variable a which comes with an index j, and that's the uh, part of the free algebra, so the index here, and the error is between 1 and h. Good. So, h, so h is not 2. h is so 2 or 2. So this is for any h. 
Um, I will use uh, Genus 2 and Muslim as an example, and that is for any age. And what are the age and what are the omegas? What are the omegas? The omegas are functions on no, uh, which functions are the uniformization. Is formation. it a definition of the function, or, or is it just notation? Therefore, are these specific functions or just symbols? Uh, for the moment, they are just symbols, and one can then determine these these functions, and that is. But, but they're meant to be. I'm here trying to define function. So they're. I'm, I'm not. A, 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 I don't understand what what is fixed or what is. So the B are formal variables. The A are some other form. Variables. So, so these are differential forms. Yeah. So uh, and these are the differential forms. I want to iteratively integrate over uh, Linda in order to spend the space of these higher so, genus algorithms. But then you have to define them. And I, I mean, in the previous case, it was DC over C minus A. Is there a formula for these things? Uh, there is no closed formula for those things, and I would be very happy if... Well, is there any description? I mean, I will, so I will actually, data, I will, I will actually uh, write a description and then prove that it is precisely the same things as these uh, forms here. So the unique you're uniquely uh, determined by some fashion. Uh, I'm about to write precisely what you say. Um, and we can show in this classification that this uh, function for this form K is uniquely determined by three properties. Um, the first one being that K E divided by uh, evaluated at the A cycle uh, A cycle shift in the variable Z on the uniformization, then I get the same function back, its form back. Second, if I uh, do the same thing with the Cycle. Okay. Then I will uh, get the exponential uh, of the formal variable uh, <coughs> BK times the original function. So that is like the periodicity phase at genus 1. And then uh, the third, and that's uh, that's the uh, that's the same beat, the formula. Yes. Okay. And then the residue of this function k e at z f is minus the sum of the genus. Formal variable i, formal variable a i is divided by 2 pi i. And this is an elaborate proof. You can actually show that these properties determine these forms uh, And z and x are on the surface, or p and z? z and x are variables on the uh, standard uniformization of the genus uh, 2 pi. What's the standard uniformization? Or, the, or on. Um, oh, wait, no, your Z is clear because you talked about. Yes. The the cycle. So it's not of the current, it's of the right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the curve. And X is. I can't identify the, the curve with the, with the variety of genus 2, of course. In, yeah, but I thought this was for all genera. So this is now for genus 2. This uh, is. No, you're running i from 1 to h, which suggests that h is in 2. Okay. Let, let me. Uh, no, but I'm just asking. So is x in the same place as z? Yes, of course. So x, well, I have no idea because you haven't written it. So x is the elements of z to the h? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, there's no way for us to know. Sorry. Okay. 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 So z to the x or z to the h? Yes, and there's no symmetry, nothing like that. In the X and Z. Is it no, no, it's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, yeah.
scanners and no, no record around BNA in the residue pool? Uh, uh, Johannes. Now I want to uh, translate this function of what is the residue of the function of several variables? Um, Sorry, Johannes, they're not in situ. You mean in the universal cover? That's that's what I said initially. No, but that's fine. It's it's component wise, well, that's his component wise. Yes. I, I, I think that. No, but we could certainly write the Jacobian the CDVH model is something, but I don't. What does the residue mean? The residue is. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, Can you just multiply it by zi minus xi for each i from 1 to h and then, no, and then set them equal? The, the Excuse me, what? They're, they live in a dimensional one, manifold, so they're just living the universal cover. That's what I said initially, but then I got confused. Um, good. Um, this is. Um, something which uh, is available, but there's a second suggestion for a uh, connection form, which, which is the KZT connection. And this is uh, the KZ is for Kuznik Samarokov, and the B is for uh, Bernard. And uh, in the context of so-called best amino vision models, that's evaluations on the, uh, in, in a conformal uh, group setting, in physics theory, so uh, there is a paper. Um, this uh, connection is actually something uh, which you uh, can write down in terms of objects which use the short key uniformization. In particular, this function K of Z and X can be written as the sum over a, excuse me, is there something, something open still? Or still puzzled. Yeah. Okay, so it's just gone. So the Z lies in an H-dimensional object, yes. which is uh, either C or two the H or the, no, uh, the the Z. Excuse me. The Z and X they are uh, variables on the Riemann surface. That is, they are on the curve. Yeah, uh, so I don't know what Z but then I don't know how you can add an A cycle. What do you mean by adding an A cycle? <coughs> so the curve that is a, does not have any building blocks. It's, it's, it's a and little an abuse of notation, it means that if you uh, would uh, perform an, uh, an integral over a path around the A cycle on one of those objects, then you would get these very uh, so problem. Wait, so are these differentials? Yes. The K is they are the omega of the form. And so I can integrate over them. And what this kind of form notation. Are, they, are they one forms? S they one forms. One forms. Ah. Uh, uh, the, the, the initial one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, let me let me make it a little shorter. Uh, we can define uh, the uh, KZP connection in a way that you uh, write a sum. Over group elements in the Schottky group over a variable minus a pole that might look very familiar to the uh, differential. I've been uh, 
defining uh, in the very beginning for Gini zero, and then there is a formal variable which uh, you can uh, assign to twisting uh, the um, to twisting the algebra uh, which appeared here with formal variables in bi to bis. Uh, this is uh, actually something which you can show to be equivalent to the uh, Brown and Levin uh, form of the Conniger function I have actually been showing at the very beginning, which I unfortunately erased. Uh, so if you take a genus 1 Trotsky group, which just has one <coughs> generator, then you can uh, manipulate with the sum uh, and show that this is equivalent to the Kronecker form function. Some of the end or if we need to have a lonely end there, the twist. Is that determined? No, I should actually uh, tell what the what the end is. So um, <coughs> there is. Um, so that's I, I made a shortcut which I shouldn't have made. So uh, in general, we want to define a capital a function capital N, which is a formal function, which in that case takes the uh, Schottky generator. Uh, a certain index which is taken to a certain power and I will immediately write it down for a, a complete set of Schottky generators and that takes it to a formal variables uh, W I1 to N1 to WIS and NS. And in the, uh, in the genus 1 case, which I'm writing down here, so Just uh, uh, I can, uh, yeah, let, let me just write W of gamma, then uh, we are fine here. Okay, so uh, this formula appeared in this paper by Dennis Bernard and was framed a suggestion for a multi-genus generalization of the Kronecker form. And, uh, but he assumed uh, that we are working on a uh, short key of information where the two short key circles are concentric. And uh, the first thing, if you want to extend or find the language for this Kronecker form for higher genera, is that we have to restore somehow or allow for the possibility that those two circles are not concentric. So, what we're going to do is we'll uh, restore a term which actually is here um, and write that our uh, conical function z x w1 of gamma is uh, the same sum as before over the Schottky proof and then uh, the same term d gamma z over gamma z minus x and then we put in a fixed point, which, and that is a very short calculation, of course. Um, and, uh, which, once I take the fixed point of the transformation, which maps the inner circle to the outer circle, is infinity, and so in Bernard's formulation, this term is finished. Now. Uh, the next step in order to get a higher genus generalization uh, is 
very, very uh, simple. We'll mimic what Enrique actually did. We will define a Kronecker type function uh, for each direction. So j is again in 1 to h. And the formula now is something which depends on all these formal variables, w in the complete Schottky group, and we have the same term as above, the same sum, but now the fixed point uh, uh, with respect to the Möbius transformation gamma j. Okay, and that's actually all we need to do, and in the remaining couple of minutes, I would like to uh, comment on what one can actually do and how one can get from, first of all, these uh, generalized uh, <coughs> representation for the Kronecker uh, form at a higher genus to actually evaluating polylogarithms, to actually uh, finding uh, or being able to do the works here. And the main, uh, the main technique which uh, uh, is useful is some kind of averaging. And this is averaging is something which many of you might have seen already in Brown's and Levin's paper where uh, Brown and Levin define uh, elliptic polylogarithms. In the first part, there is always the um, definition of elliptic polylogarithms in terms of iterated intercourse over the kernels which are generated by the Kronecker function. But in the second part, the elliptic polylogarithms are given as weighted averages of genus zero polylogarithms. And we'll precisely see the same happening here. So, in short, you can rewrite the function of j uh, in terms of some partial, or just, just do some partial uh, fractioning here, and uh, this will lead to a representation of the following form which is dz over z minus gamma x minus dz over z minus gamma pj, w of gamma. And uh, just from the formal uh, similarity, you can see that this component of the higher genus Kronecker function is a sum over uh, differentials of the form which we used for genus zero polylogarithms. It is just that the fixed point and the fixed point of the generator uh, are weighted or uh, modified by this uh, generator gamma. So um, this can be generalized, and uh, I will not write the complete formula down because I want to show some of the results. The statement is uh, it is possible and this is something which is a calculation you can do uh, and uh, of course uh, and to express all higher uh, Kronecker uh, forms Fj as Schottky averages. So by Schottky average, I mean to uh, take a sum of all group elements and uh, do transformations on the uh, internal variables like here. Uh, as Schottky averages over Known 
minus 1 polygon. It's 4. You could actually integrate this precisely and you would get the uh, standard uh, generating form for elliptic polylogarithms in Braun and Levin's paper. Uh, right away. Now, uh, for genus 2 here. Yeah. Uh, that's for genus 2 or for general? Uh, this is a, a component which uh, it behaves like, uh, each component behaves in principle like a genus 1, uh, or a genus, excuse me, a genus H minus 1 conic matrix. So ah, here, okay. uh, it's precisely the step very good okay. from right. genus. So the statement here with genus 1 was for genus 2, the second statement. The second second statement is uh, I need to tell that I can do that iteratively yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again and again, and okay. finally I can express all differential forms in terms of the known uh, forms that have been So uh, I should say there is a complicated. Uh, well, let me simply write that there is a lot of combinatorics involved, uh, which uh, most easily is then put on a computer, but I don't want to uh, actually um, bore you with the long formula. Is there, I'm sorry, is there a direct relation between the formula that involves uh, F over there and the formula involves F over here. So this Fj, no, which are the components, is precisely that Fj is that, over sorry, here if I specify uh, something on uh, dimension, uh, on genus 2. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, on genus 1. Okay, uh, now one can prove or show that um, that the kernels, if you uh, now would actually expand this function into a formal kernel, uh, as you would do with the Enrique's Kronecker function, you can show that the uh, Schottky Kronecker function will give you precisely the same kernels, like the Enrique's uh, kernel. Uh, like the Enrique's kernel. And that is most efficiently done by using the three properties which uniquely determine the uh, Kronecker function, which then goes into the LLB connection and origins. So, uh, we can show that the validity, uh, we can show the validity of one, two, and three. And uh, thus, uh, it is also using the glance from Enriquez. Uh, we can show that the space of functions we want as iterated integrals or expansion coefficients of this Kronecker function is uh, the same space as is spanned by Enriquez. When you say we, I, I, I will say at the end <laughs> who is. Who is V? Well, we can say it right now. So V is a uh, uh, mean together with a, a group of three students, one master student and uh, two PhD students in Zurich, uh, where the uh, uh, good part of what is on the platform right now is uh, done by a master student, actually. Uh, his name is Artyom Nizitsyn. And the numerical uh, uh, representation is mostly, so we will show a nice picture in the last five minutes, is mostly to the student whose name is Yegor. And of course, this has benefited from many discussions with numerous people, some of which are in this room. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry for time reasons. I. Uh, could also uh, show some details of this calculation, but maybe it is better to actually show you that once you have this recursion, you know very well the analytical properties of the uh, genus 1 forms, then we can actually do uh, numerics 
and numerically integrate polylogarithms and get numbers for a given value locally on the uh, short information. exceed your vision underneath. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, <really> does. <laughs> it actually does. So, um, in short, we are able to uh, start from an algebraic curve. Then, it is an algebraic curve which in the defining polynomial only has uh, real uh, that, defining <laughs> that the defining polynomial only has real roots, then there is a formalism to obtain a Schottky, um, a Schottky representation of the associated curve. And once we have this, then we can uh, calculate the differential uh, forms we need and want to integrate uh, from uh, combinatorial expressions over the genus one kernels we know. And now uh, it is, of course, a interesting and very important question, how does these uh, sums, which are actually particular automatic forms, the sums over the Schottky group actually converge? And the first thing I wanted to show here is that this is highly depending on the representations we are choosing. So uh, here is, uh, on, the, on the lower axis, there is the uh, Schottky element and what is Written here is actually, if you would start with a one letter uh, group element from uh, generators to two to three to four, and then it's just numbered. And you can see that uh, the value, and this is for a certain matrix norm, uh, and then contribution to the sum, which is just a number, and we take the absolute value of it, is uh, for a example curve, I think it's. Uh, the first example is phi squared is x times x minus 1 times x minus 6 times x minus 7 times x minus 12 or something like that. Uh, you can see that the contribution to the sum of the actual value of the differential form somehow, if you're friendly, uh, goes in, in stairs. That is, whenever I add another, uh, another length of the word, then the contribution drops uh, very much. Now, this has been plotted here for two different curves, but we have also been comparing with two uh, equivalent Schottky representations. And the convergence, the numerical convergence, depends very much on which Schottky uh, representation you actually use. Uh, so you could also get a very similar picture if you use two different uh, short so what, are, what, are these, what are these cycles again? The, the, this is the number of this the is, length of the word? It's, it's just a number. This of is the length of the word? More or less. It's the, uh, no, no. Yeah. you're not take, taking words of ten to the four. <laughs> no, if I would uh, sort, the, sort the, the group elements canonically. 
So you start with... But you just numbered them, and this is the first five I, I just number them, but I do so that uh, if the length of the word is larger, then also the number will be larger. Unless you take all the short words first, okay, then three. Yeah. Uh, so, so why did this, what was it you said that it had this like, cyclic, this periodic looking behavior? It's not really cyclic. Well, well, it looks like, like, it like, no, no, it looks like waves. I mean, it looks like, yeah. that's what I thought you said. Yeah. Any rapid yeah. function does, it goes yeah. up for a while, then it goes down it, for a while. It goes some, somehow in uh, plateaus. And wherever you go to the next plateau, if you add a letter to the plus. Well, that's what I was asking. So every time you add a letter, this is one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in other words, now is the point where we can start to play the games, finding out what would be the analog of choosing, for example, a clever modular parameter if I'm in a one setup in order to get amazingly fast convergence of the Q series uh, if I'm doing that type of calculation, just that there's a layer of the Schottky uh, formulation in between. I, I should mention that all these uh, numbers, are, or this implementation is really uh, very much in the infancy, so we can show, and that's on the next picture, we can actually calculate a genus 2 polyloid. So, Okay, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the number is colored, and only half of the number is colored for obvious reasons. Uh, so this uh, is for a value of z, z being a manifold, a complex number, and we've been drawing the Schottky cycles uh, in the uh, C bar, and uh, you can actually see now what I said at the beginning, that the complete outer domain is mapped into each of those circles, and that we get a, a completely smooth function, so only the, only the argument is drawn here for this genus 2 polylogarithm. This is a very simple polylogarithm, and there is more plots with a little more interesting uh, polylogs where you can also nicely identify branch cuts uh, for example, uh, where the phase of the calculated value actually jumps uh, once you have a certain uh, generator in the first or last slot, depending on how you formulate these things. So, uh, Anas, is it easy to say which genus 2 polylogarithm, say in terms of Enrique's ingredients? Yes. Or? Uh, uh, one. Uh, oh my god, ah, I should, should put the indices down. I think it's one to one, but I can look ah, okay. it up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this, I would like to ask you to please see this rather, rather as a proof of concept. We can show that the uh, integrated uh, objects have the right properties, they will have poles, which come from the poles of the kernels, and we can actually also show that. Uh, the behavior <coughs> on these cycles, once we transform them around, is precisely what we expect. But um, I would like to ask for a little patience in order to make that a really uh, reliable uh, numerical implementation. <laughs> but now one can, one can start to do beautiful things. Uh, one last comment, uh, please. Uh, what we can get here with a reasonable amount of time for each of those dots I think that that's about 1,000 dots uh, in one direction. The calculation takes about four to five seconds. Uh, so there was a night where this, this picture was done. But I would expect that once one exploits the uh, functional properties of those objects, then one can definitely gain a lot more precision pretty easily. Uh, that's the first thing, and I already made the cautious argument that this is really something which we are developing right now and uh, which I hope will be more powerful in the future. Thank you very much. Okay.